all for inviting me here tonight. It's been a real pleasure. Um, I see everybody that comes across the stage, and it, and it really does humble me. It's great work that you all do. Good evening. My name is Neil Polnack, and I'm a wounded veteran from Operation Learning Freedom. I'm here to talk to you tonight about how my injuries made it difficult for me to get a job. But because of Nish and the work that you all do, I was able to get back into the workforce. You might not get a chance to meet the hundreds and thousands of the people that you help provide opportunities for. So I'm here to put a face to at least one of those numbers. I was going to deploy to Afghanistan with the 64th Engineer Battalion of the U.S. Army in 2006. It was around September 2nd, 2007, when my unit was in the Paktika region of Afghanistan. This is a mountainous area known for its periodic attacks on coalition soldiers and bases. A previous convoy was taken to drop the Connex, which is in essence a large metal box full of sensitive equipment. Our mission was to provide security for the unit that was dispatched to recover it. We were, Humvee, we were in a Humvee, and there were five of us, and my job was turret gunner. So I was basically like a prairie dog with my head sticking out the top with my 50 caliber machine gun pointed out. I was looking all around for any signs of danger. And as we were on our way back from the mission, the truck in front of us was kicking up a lot of dust, making it very difficult for me to see. I had a feeling that there was something that just wasn't right about the valley we were traveling through. Suddenly there was an explosion about 15 feet behind our Humvee. I could feel a shockwave through my entire body. Since my head was exposed, I was hit in the face with shrapnel and I fractured the joints of my jaw. We found a safe place to pull over and assess the damage. I can remember holding my jaw with one hand while I completed the incident report with the other. We returned safely to the base and I went to the aid station. There I received stitches and antibiotics and I volunteered to go back to my unit. About three weeks later, on September 21st, we had another incident. We were on, on a mission to retrieve supplies and deliver personnel to another base. And we had to travel through territory that hadn't been cleared by a route clearance patrol and deemed safe. This isn't something that we normally do. As we drove to the area, I got that same feeling that something wasn't right. We were traveling through a small city with a fair amount of buildings, but there was no one there to greet us. This time, there wasn't even the children to throw rocks at us. <coughs> there were bicycles, parked vehicles, and trash that only accumulates in the active marketplace. But once again, I noticed there was no people. So I relayed my observations to the convoy commander and he agreed with my assessment. He ordered us to move out of the city as quickly as possible. As we accelerated, we drove over a bump in the road and landed an IED, and it exploded. My helmet and radio headset were blown off, and I was knocked unconscious. I was sitting outside the top of the vehicle until someone was going to pull me back in. <clears throat> the Humvee was so badly damaged that it lost power to not start. We were in total darkness. We lost all our communication. We were wondering if it was the end for us. Fortunately, my driver was able to get the vehicle restarted. <clears throat> and he was able to look us at about five miles an hour out of the danger zone. We connected to another Humvee from the convoy, we were pulled safely back to base. We were all injured, and we all survived. I thought we were going to be okay, and it was just another close call. I thought it was just another close call. But what happened next changed everything. I had a headache from the blast, but aside from that, I thought it was going to be okay. But the doctors were concerned because they said that two closed head injuries within three weeks' time could cause significant damage. They told me I had to be medevaced to Bogdan Hospital. To say the least, I felt ridiculous being medevaced for nothing more than a headache. I wasn't bleeding, I had my arms and my legs, and I only went because it was a direct order from my lieutenant. When I got to the hospital, I was waiting outside in the tent waiting for my appointment, and I got a strange coppery taste in my mouth that I had never had before. I stepped out to get out a bottle of water, and that's when it happened. I had a grand mal seizure. It felt like one minute, I was outside drinking a bottle of water, and the next minute I was lying in the dirt. My water bottle was crushed in my hand, I had a lump on my forehead, and I lost control of my bladder. I didn't know what happened. I was actually wondering if someone had stuck to punch me when I wasn't looking. There were two soldiers that were standing over me, and they told me that I had a seizure. They seemed kind of freaked out, and they ran off. I wasn't sure if I should believe him. I was actually wondering if it was one of them to knock me down. <laughs> I was in a daze, so I went to go see the doctor, and he told me that these seizures can be caused by significant head injury. 
He recommended that I go to Langstuhl Hospital in Germany for further tests. At Langstuhl, they did an MRI, and the MRI showed a sac of spinal fluid in my brain where it should not be. It's called an arachnoid cyst. These can be caused by significant trauma to the brain. To simplify it, when you bump your arm, it causes it, it, it injures blood vessels in the form of bruise under the skin. As the bruise heals, the blood gets absorbed back into your system. But with an arachnoid cyst, trauma forces spinal fluid into your brain, and it causes a cyst. And because the brain is so close tightly in your skull, the bubble can be trapped there. And it's vacuum sealed in, and it puts pressure on things where it should not be. In some ways, it can affect your brain like a tumor. For example, an arachnoid cyst can have different signs and symptoms for different people. It depends on the size of the cyst and where it's located. Some can cause no symptoms at all, and some can paralyze, and some can kill you. Mine is only the size of a grain of rice, but it happens to cause seizures. Also, like brain tumors, some cysts can be removed by surgery. But they would have to open my skull to take it out. And sometimes just getting to the part of the brain where the cyst is located can cause more damage than just leaving it there. The doctor explained to me in real simple terms that the brain is like jello. If you jiggle a little bit, it stays the same. But if you do something really disturbing, like smash it against a wall or set off a couple explosions next to it, it damages the cells on a microscopic level. You might not be able to see the damage right away, but the damage is still there. And cell by cell, you'll be able to see over time that it's not the same as it was before. They sent me back to America to recuperate and receive further assessments. I was expecting to heal and go right back to my unit in Afghanistan. I didn't want to leave. I knew they were short-staffed, and I knew that they needed me. I felt the personal responsibility for the mission, and I shared a bond with my fellow soldiers. I just wanted to heal and get back as soon as possible. On October 2nd, 2007, I came home on a plane with about 50 other wounded veterans. Some had head wounds that were bundled up in gauze, some were missing their arms or their legs, some were caught sucked up to respirators, and some were not even conscious. We touched down in Air Force Base in Tacoma, and we were finally home. But medical flights don't get the same welcoming that you see on TV. There's no crying spouses, no children jumping into their parents' arms, no red, white, blue balloons, or American flags waving. We were greeted by an army chaplain, a full medical staff, and a line of ambulances waiting to take us to the hospital. They took us to Madigan Army Medical Center, where they did a full assessment of my injuries. In addition to the brain damage, which they call TBI, also known as traumatic brain injury, I had, I had, I had a shoulder, shoulder injury requiring surgical repair and compressed discs in my lower back. As a result of the evaluation, I was reassigned to a new unit, the WTU, also known as the Warrior Transition Unit. I was shocked. I never assumed that I would be reassigned. I had a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. And I remember asking the doctor, so as soon as I get better from this, am I going to go back to my unit? And they said, no, that's not guaranteed. Your next mission is going to be based on the needs of the Army. I finally allowed myself to think this might be real. As far as my health was concerned, I didn't get any better, but I also didn't get any worse. I had seizures about once a month, and I was placed on multiple seizure medications as the doctors tried to determine which one would work best for me. After about seven or eight months of doctor's appointments and physical therapy, I heard the four words, it broke my heart and changed my life forever. And those words were not fit for duty. My case manager warned me that this might happen, but it was still painful to hear. I had a great record as a soldier. I had excellent marksmanship skills. I had a history of taking on extra responsibility and getting promoted. I had even won the Pan Autry Award for Engineer Soldier of the Battalion. It might be, seem foolish looking at it from the outside, but in my heart, I hope that they might look past some of my injuries due to my record and allow me to go back to my unit. I still felt I had plenty of ability to give. I could still back someone up. I could still carry one of my friends away from danger. It might hurt my back, but in my heart I knew I could do it. On the other hand, I do understand why they classified me as they did. You can't hold a gun if you have seizures. You can't drive a Humvee. You can't protect your fellow soldiers. And in many ways become a danger to them. You really are not fit for duty. Emotionally, I wasn't done being in the Army, but the writing was on the wall, and it was done with me. Like it or not, I had to change my focus and start planning on a tr transition to civilian life. The WTU is an assignment for soldiers who are recovering and trying to figure out if they would be leaving the military or going back to their unit. Between doctor's appointments and physical therapy, I worked on my resume and I attended courses on things such as interviewing skills and computer software. 
I was told this was December 2008, I was being placed on the TDRL list, which is also known as the Dis Temporary Disability Retirement List. This mean, means the Army wants to wait to see if I get better from my injuries or not. And I'll be reevaluated in five years, December 2013, to see if I can rejoin the Army. During this time, I can keep certain military benefits like health coverage, but my salary was decreased by over 45%. My wife had my first son while we were deployed, and we were expecting our second, so I had a family to support. I had to find a disability job to supplement my income. It was July, and I had to have a job lined up for January. The economy wasn't in the best shape, but I thought I could find something by then. All I needed to get was just one job. I found out it wasn't that easy for me. I had many years of experience in the construction industry, but because of my seizure disorder, I could no longer use skill saws or work with power tools. I couldn't work on roofs or anything at a great height. So construction jobs were out for me. I experienced as a vocational nurse, but to get licensed in a new state, I would need to spend at least one year in training, and we needed income immediately. So that was also out. On top of this, in the state of Washington, anyone with a seizure disorder cannot drive a car until you're at least six months seizure free. And I had never had that. I'd never be able to get more than a month. So I needed to find a job that I could get to without driving or without placing any hardship on my wife and my children. I had some strengths. I had a good work history, and as a non-commissioned officer, I had experience in administration and leadership. So I set my sights on another federal job, something within the prison system, hopefully. I sent out about 200 resumes. I don't know if I was a good resume writer, or if I just wasn't qualified, but I didn't hear anything back. My wife and I became extremely worried. We cut down on all of our expenses, and we would only buy things that they were a necessity. And even then, then, we weren't having all the money that we needed. We started using a credit card to pay for the basic essentials. We racked up a couple thousand dollars in debt. We were excited about having a new baby, but we were also terrified. I used to pray to God every night and ask, Lord, please let me find just one job. Let me provide for my family. I started to panic and I sent resumes everywhere. I applied to work at fast food restaurants and retail stores. I applied to wait tables or clean dishes. I'd take anything. Out of the 200 resumes I sent out, I only got two phone calls back. One was a rejection for a management position at McDonald's, but even a rejection call was better than nothing at that point. I knew somebody was reading my resume. The other was to set up an interview at a Sears retail store as a salesperson in the tools department. I went to the interview in Lacey, Washington, and it went well, and they offered me a job on the spot. I remember that as I got in the car to go home, I was so happy I cried. I breathed a sigh of relief and I thought, thank you, God. The pay was pretty low. It was actually below minimum wage, but it didn't come with the commission. I did the math that even if I were to add, even if I were to be the top salesperson there, my entire paycheck for the month wouldn't even cover my mortgage. Not to mention food, electricity, or diapers. But at least I had something coming in while I looked for a better paying job. I started a few days later, and what happened next, I think, was meant to be. A gentleman came into the store looking for a tool combination kit to work on his roof. While I was processing his order, he gave me his work email address, which ended at scoopum.org. I asked him, is that the same Scoopum that works at the Situation Facility in Fort Lewis? He said, yes it is. How have you heard about us? I told him that I recently retired from the military and I turned all my equipment into his, his company. And he explained to me something I'd never heard before. The Scoopum is a company that hires people with disabilities. I never knew that. I told him a little bit about my injuries, and that's when he gave me his business card, and he said, we have some job openings, and I think we can help you. He asked me to come in for an interview the next day. When I looked down at his card, I read, Mike Gentleman, Scoop and General Manager. I remember having a feel of acceleration, but also of dread. I happened to stumble across not only a company that hired somebody in my exact position, but a general manager nonetheless. I must have replayed the conversation in my mind a hundred times to make sure I had to sabotage myself. <laughs> My wife and I stayed up praying about it the whole night long. I interviewed with the company and it went really well. As I was walking in the door of my house the same day, the phone rang with a job offer for to be a supply clerk in the warehouse. My responsibilities were going to be to process and issue parts received for the repair of military vehicles. Something I knew about, something I could understand, and something I was familiar with. They provided me OSHA training and I acquired new job skills. It was safe for me to work there if I had a seizure. They, they were trained, they were willing to work with me, and they understood what I was working with. So far, I've not had a seizure while I'm working, but I've come close. When I feel one about to come on, I'm able to take medication, 
eat crackers and follow my doctor's instructions. One month after we started work, I had my second son, but this time I wasn't questioning if I could provide for him. In the middle of 2011, I received more good news. I applied for a promotion at Fort Meade, Maryland, and I got it. I was promoted to safety, quality, and environmental compliance officer. And this week, I paid my family to move all the way across the country to the state of Maryland. In my new job, I was responsible for making sure all the safety equipment at Fort Meade was fully stocked and up to date. I developed, implemented, and monitored quality control programs and conducted inspections. I obtained a secret security clearance and learned even more job skills. I attended an OSHA 10 hour and 30 hour training course, and I received training in the Hazardous Waste Operations and Emergency Response Standard, also known as HazWalker. I was able to pay off all of my credit card debt while I was there, and my wife was able to be a stay at home mom with our two sons, which eventually turned into three. <laughs> <laughs> I had been there about one year and things were going great. And that's when it was brought to my attention that Scoopin was just awarded a new contract in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, working for the Department of Energy. I was asked if I had any interest in the position. It would be a promotion, and I was qualified for it because of the training and security clearance I got at Fort Meade. But the Department of Energy is a completely different customer than the Department of Defense. All of the acronyms, all of the regulations, all of the ways I've conducted myself over the last nine years would have to be rewritten. After much prayer and consideration with my wife, I applied for the position, and I was ecstatic when Scoopin offered me the job. So just this past August, Scoopin once again moved my family, this time to Knoxville, Tennessee, and we love it there. The boys couldn't be happier with their new schools and sports teams, and our new home was amazing. And I know my contributions are valued at work. As a safety and quality control manager, I'm responsible for making sure that the vehicles are inspected, serviced, and repaired with a zero defect standard. I'm also responsible for making sure that the personnel performing this work don't hurt themselves or each other. Those a demanding job and sometimes stressful students prepared me to meet these challenges. I am honored beyond words that they trust me with such an important responsibility. I found a home with Scoopum and I'll be there for as long as they'll allow me. My employment with Scoopum changed my life in a profound way. I don't just think about surviving the here and now anymore. I'm able to plan for the future. I can relax and enjoy life with my family. I have choices again. And I know that this is a part because of everyone here in the audience, people like you, and all the work that you do. I give you my heartfelt thanks. You've changed my life. I never heard of this program before I was hired on by Skuga, but it's extremely important. It makes me even prouder that I serve my, for my country, and there are thousands of big success stories just like my own. I serve my country in uniform, and they just serve me. And for that, I give you my heartfelt thanks.